Welcome to our Different Brains Speaker Series installment for January, ADHD and Motivation, Tools for Achieving Your Goals in 2022. My name is Sarai Welch, and I'm an intern at Different Brains, and I want to thank everyone for attending. This webinar will have live closed captioning generated by otter.ai. These can be controlled using the CC button on your Zoom dashboard. Different Brains is a nonprofit organization that strives to encourage understanding and acceptance of individuals who have variation in brain function and social behaviors known as neurodiversity. Our mission has three pillars. One, to mentor neurodiverse adults in maximizing their potential for employment and independence. Two, to increase awareness of neurodiversity by producing interactive media. And three, to foster the new generation of neurodivergent self-advocates. Here at Different Brains, we promote awareness through the production of a variety of neurodiverse media content, including our multiple web series, blogs, podcasts, movies, and documentaries, all available for free at differentbrains.org. All of our content is worked on by those in the mentorship program, through which we aid individuals in taking the first steps towards achieving their goals, finding their voice, expanding their social skills, and understanding of the professional world. Additionally, we have begun facilitating research projects to better understand the ways people can maximize their potential. To find more information or to make a tax-deductible donation, please visit our website at differentbrains.org. Before we start, I want to invite everyone to send questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom or by putting questions in the chat box. And now I'm going to hand it over to our pre presenters for this evening, Brooke Schnitt Schnittman, sorry, and Ali Idris. No worries. A very ADHD thing of me. I haven't changed my last name yet, so <laughs> it should be Clemens. Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Okay, okay. I'm going to share the screen real quick. We're going to get started. Welcome, everybody. Thank you, Sarai, for the warm welcome. Hello, Brooke. Hello, everybody. Hi, Ali. My name's Ali. I've been an intern at Different Brains for about almost two years now. I was diagnosed with ADHD at seven years old. And uh, I've, I've been meaning to, you know, share my journey and help others with the tools that have, uh, allowed, to overcome, uh, that have allowed me to overcome the many challenges I've, I've faced along the way. I'm currently a second year uh, uh, second bachelor's at FAU, Florida Atlantic University, doing my uh, second bachelor's in neuroscience. Um, I rated my bachelor's in biology. I aspire to become a physician. At Different Brains, I'm co-host of ADHD Power Tools with the lovely Brooke Schnittman, and I'm doing a research on college students with ADHD, and I'm loving every bit of it. And today we, uh, we're doing this webinar, and I'm excited to go ahead, Brooke, introduce yourself. Thank you for the warm introduction. It's lovely to see all of you popping in and using the chat. The more you engage, the more you'll get out of it. And the more you think about what you want to get out of it, the more um, you'll look for that. So my name, as Ali said, is Brooke Schnittman. I'm the CEO and founder of Coaching with Brooke. We're an ADHD and executive function coach at coaching company for motivated students and adults with ADHD, eight years old and up. And we are seeing people worldwide. So we have clients in Singapore, UK, everywhere. Um, originally, I'm from New York, graduated from NYU with my master's in students with disabilities in 2006. And then I became a special education teacher on Long Island. I turned assistant director of special education, working with primarily ADHDers and uh, students with learning disabilities. And then I moved to Florida to be closer to my family, started my company in 2018, where we have a combined experience of over 50 years of working with ADHD. So we have seven coaches on board, um, just hired a recovery coach. So it just keeps on expanding to make a greater impact. Uh, we've worked with over a thousand clients um, who have ADHD. So I'm very excited to be here and be Ali's co-host. We have videoed close to 80 videos, I think. At yes, this point. yes. And um, I just wanna apologize in advance if you hear a lot of loud breathing in my voice. <laughs> I am eight months pregnant and proud of it. And every time I eat and it's late at night, it's hard to project. So I apologize if you're noise sensitive and you hear that. 
Um, but Ali and I have really um, worked collaboratively together to film these short little tidbits, ADHD power tools. It could be found on both of our YouTube um, YouTubes and it's taken off. It's been over a year now, I believe. Yes, yes. So we said it's finally time to do a webinar for everyone and, you know, get that this information out there, information that's popular to uh, uh, the ADHDers. And um, also, I started an ADHD ed camp three years ago, and um, that's a, a free day summit for ADHDers and 30 ADHD experts who spend their time and day helping the community. So that's been wonderful as well. So looking forward to working with you guys today. Yes, yes, I'm super excited too. Um, without further ado, let's hop right in. Okay. Um, so our goal today in the next 45 minutes, we already are a couple minutes in, uh, we'll be learning how to manage and achieve um, your 2022 goals by gaining control of your motivation with ADHD. Um, there'll be around 30 minutes of uh, a regular presentation over topics and we'll hop into the Q&A. It might vary, um, might go over a little under, who knows how many questions we got, but um, stick along, enjoy the ride. Brooke, you can go over to today's topics. Sure. So today we're going to be talking about everything that's related to motivation and how to increase our motivation. So that includes our interest level which is also correlated to our level of dopamine. We're gonna talk about flow states and how we use our flow states to activate. And with those flow states, we get motivated. Knowing our why behind setting a goal and an action and an intention, what else can interfere with motivation? And then use all of that to set 2022 goals. Awesome. Let's get right in. Brooke, I want to ask you, um, what is the connection between motivation, interest level, and dopamine? Or dopamine? What are some uh, tools to increase our motivation? Sure. So the human brain needs dopamine. And it's dopamine is a neurotransmitter that facilitates communication between neurons to be fully activated or switched on so that you can pay attention focus, and self-regulate. So ADHDers, the dopamine levels are either really high or really depleted. So we are constantly seeking dopamine. So for us, when we have these low dopamine levels, it also contributes to low levels of interest and vice versa. So even if you want to focus on something, like you want to get off the couch and go do something, you just can't because your dopamine is so low that you're unable to activate to do the task. This is the opposite of what a lot of us hear, but this is called a state of hypo focus. And instead of asking yourself, how can I make myself do this boring task, which so many of us just try to force ourselves to do it. Let's think of an opportunity to say, how can I make this task more interesting or activate my brain for this task so it's easier to do? Because it's really hard when we have those low dopamine levels. And on the contrary, when you have high dopamine levels, you have a high level of interest. So we're going to get into this later on, so I'm not going to belabor it. But when you have a whole to-do list of 50 things, but you're excited by something that is interesting to you, that will give you those high dopamine levels. So that leads to a high level of hyper focus. And I'm sure a lot of you have heard of that before. And this is when it becomes so high our interest level that we lose track of time and have difficulty pulling away from the task. So sometimes we do this and we forget about things. So that is when you have to really take a look at how you're in your hyper-focus. So it's not bad to have hyper-focus, but make sure that when you get into that hyper-focus state, you're doing it at a time that you don't have other responsibilities that are getting in the way. Yeah, 100%. And, and to 
to chime in on the how, how to increase that interest level um, in certain tasks, you know, um, you want to ask yourself, hey, you want you want to try to make the task more bearable. You want by asking, how can I do this in a way that works for me? What might make it feel worthwhile? So an, an example, oops, I, did I just, yeah, I just switched it. I'm getting used to this program, my bad. So, so an example on how to make a task more interesting um, is, for example, say one day you're going to the gro grocery store, you gotta do some grocery shopping, a classic errand that we all gotta run. Maybe you can go with a friend, uh, making it you know, a little less boring and start, you know, kind of do that socializing at the same time or shop late night when the line is not as, uh, as long, when it's not as busy. Um, you know, minimize that, you know, the agony of waiting in line or shop at a different store, new experiences, new brands, make it into an adventure. And the same goes for other things like going to the gym. You can work out with a workout buddy, make it more exciting, or you can go to a different section, different part of the gym, um, look out, look up new workouts and go, or even go at a different time of the day. So these are little things that can increase that interest level in a workout. And don't forget, sometimes you need to replenish your dopamine pool. Um, and not take part in really extreme like dop dopaminogenic behaviors and give that which give you that extra dopamine lift. Um, and that's why I think intermittent release of dopamine is super important. Um, you don't want to expect to release that high level, those high levels of dopamine every time you engage in certain activities. So how, ca how can you release an intermittent um, uh, release of dopamine? So um, say, for example, you're out with your friends and you usually have two drinks with your friends. Break it down to one, for example. Or maybe you have a cup of coffee before going to work. I know it might be tough not having a cup of coffee before going to work, but switch it up, you know, create that intermittent release of dopamine. Um, maybe not take your phone out during class. I'm a college student and it is so hard to sometimes not take that phone out during class or waking up extra early for a workout. So, and, and it's hard for us with ADHD to create that routine or that, that schedule for the intermittent release of dopamine, that, that, that routine. So, uh, a dopamine supportive element and just flip a coin and, you, you know, see, see where it lands and try something different. So that's what I would say to increase that interest level uh, uh, in, in the tasks you, you partake in. Yeah. And um, Andrew Huberman talks a lot about dopamine. I know that he is a supporter of the ADHD world. So if you want to learn more, he goes into um, the dopamine levels and what can increase your dopamine um, to help you stay motivated. For sure. For sure. And a lot of this stuff, I mean, Andrew Huberman, I learned a lot from, he has a YouTube channel podcast and talks a lot of great stuff. So I couldn't agree more. Andrew Huberman, someone Andrew. else. Okay. Yep. Yep. Got it. All so, right. Next topic, flow states and activation. I want to ask you, Brooke, what are flow states and how does it lead to activation? So flow is the most addictive state on earth. So just say that to yourself. It's the most addictive state on earth. So think about things that give you flow. Um, it's the source of intrinsic motivation. So people are addicted to getting the flow because it feels so good and you're motivated to do so much. So what triggers this addictive state? Uh, the neurochemical changes in your brain with the flow states like norepinephrine, dopamine, anandamide, serotonin, endorphins, all of those things start changing with flow states. And you know, endorphins are performance enhancing chemicals. So with the increase of endorphins, you are going to be able to perform better. So we take in more deeply and we process it more quickly with the norepinephrine and the dopamine. And then these chemicals impact our motivation, our creativity, and our learning. So Stephen Kotler talks about flow states. You can look him up. There's a quiz. We linked it right here on the slide. Um, if you just put in Stephen Kotler and flow state quiz, you'll find it. And you can find how you can get into your flow state. Everyone has a different way of getting into it. Some people do it right before they take a nap, like they start thinking creatively. That's how they get into their flow state, like right before they fall asleep. 
Some people get into it by taking a shower. Some people are hard chargers. So they need to do some really physical activities to start thinking creatively and, and get motivated. But these flow states can also get you into that hyper-focus zone. So you just gotta be careful and make sure that you're doing it at a time where you're not prioritizing other things that you need to, and also that you know that you can come down from it healthy without burnout. Yes, 100%. And you know, uh, that flow state, uh, a lot of us with ADHD, it's that hyper-focus. We, to, to, to engage in certain tasks, it's either, uh, it's like, there's like a do or die deadline and it's super urgent. Um, or it's super challenging, or it's super interesting. We were talking about interest level earlier. And, um, you know, hyper-focus is more likely to occur in, in that state when you, it's, it's, it's pretty challenging. And it just, I want to go over like a quick, you know, little recipe on how to maybe approach your tasks and what you do every day with that hyper-focus mindset. You're just trying to focus harder and, and fall into that flow state and activate. Um, number one, do what you're passionate in, do what you're interested in. We talked about that. Um, and slide before something that you're interested in, passionate, and don't be afraid to take risks. If you're into something difficult, different or difficult, dive deeper into it, uh, embrace it, and don't let others uh, around you bring you down. Don't tell, if, if you're really into something, don't let people uh, bring you down on it. Um, it's okay to get hyper focused on a certain task and end up not reaching your goal with it. Um, sometimes we go into that little rabbit hole, and it's it's okay to to uh, fail at it or or um, you know. It, in the end of the day, you're creating important experiences that will help you learn more and sometimes um, open new and life-changing doors. Um, surround yourself with people who appreciate the risk you take, people that understand your hyperfocus, who sometimes also fall into these hyperfocus rabbit holes too. Um, maybe they can embrace it or maybe they can help you snap out of it when the time isn't right. So that's, that's um, I think it's super important to understand those, those points to you know, approach the task in that, in that kind of mindset. And I saw we had a question come in about, you know, what do you do when you get into the hyper-focused state? So we can certainly answer all of those questions at the end. Um, how do you get yourself out of it? How do you tell other people about it? Happy to answer that at the end. So thank you for um, the chat box. Knowing your why, that's the next topic. Brooke, I want to ask you, why is knowing your why so important? So our why which I know I see some of you guys who have taken my 3C activation program, but knowing your why leads you to become more clear, more focused, and understand what motivates you about achieving your goals. So the trap that us ADHDers fall into is when we are comparing ourselves to other people or other people around us, our friends, our family, our significant others are telling us what we should be doing. And then we go ahead and do that. And, in, and when we do that, very often we're not motivated to do it for the right reasons. And we might stop doing it until we complete it. We might stop at 90%, we might stop at 50%, and then we feel bad for ourselves and shame each other um, for it. So knowing your why is strictly to understand your motivation behind doing a task, a goal, and so on. And I have this why funnel that if you just ask yourself, why am I motivated about this goal? What will it help me achieve when I finish it? And you repeat those two questions over and over again until you get so clear that you know how you feel when you finish this goal. So if you have that somewhere, you get it out of your head, you put it down on paper, and you understand that it's your motivation behind doing it, you're less likely to give up and you're more motivated and excited to do the goal. Yes, I, I, I agree 100% with what you're saying, Brooke. And I think knowing your why is one thing, but also reminding yourself what your why is. Sometimes we tend to forget why we're doing something, why we're trying to achieve something. And um, I have a few ways, you know, just to remind yourself what your why is. Number one, sticky notes. I know we've, everyone's heard about sticky notes at least once. And sticky notes are so important in your car, in your bathroom, in your, in your hallway, on your door, in your room. You can even put it on your laptop these days, you know, with, with Zoom calls, you can always put a sticky note around your desk space and everything is over Zoom. So just writing down 
once you figure out your why, once you know what your why is, write it down in a sticky note and remind yourself of it. Surround yourself with it. Other ways to surround yourself with knowing your why. Listening to podcasts and channels, such as one that's called Motivation Hub. Um, just stay motivated. Take on a day. Say you want to go to a workout when you're trying to achieve this certain goal. Um, remind yourself. Read biographies and autobiographies of su- successful people out there. Um, some good ones I recommend are Seven Habits of Highly Effective People and uh, Rich Dad, Poor Dad by Robert Kiyosaki. We'll, we'll plug that into the chat um, uh, later on. Or if anyone has a question, we can let you, give you guys the titles of those books. But even hang up a photo of someone inspiring or something inspiring. And if you're into a certain goal, um, look at those who have achieved that goal and try to understand how they did it, how they did it. Pick up what is what you think is useful and move on. For a really good example uh, is I, I've, I've been aspiring to be a physician uh, as, a, as a very, very young kid. There's certain experience I've gone through that wanted me to go after that. I want to help people. There's many reasons why, but a really big a part of knowing why I want to do it and understanding why I want to do it and help that helps me remind me is when I, once I started shadowing doctors, once I was engaged and immersed into that world um, and saw those inspiring figures walking around and understanding it more, uh, it really changed the game. I seeing the patient and the doctor interact and see how the doctor helped the patient and treated the patient and put the smile on the face and just the problem solving and medical decision making. Once I saw it, once I immersed myself in it, um, and that's you know that's a little example of how um, it, how it's so important to uh, to to have those inspiring figures and um, to help you know your why. Next, I want to ask you, Brooke, what else can interfere with motivation? Sure. So procrastination conditions, rejection, sensitive dysphoria, which is a really popular um, thing that people are talking about in the ADHD community. So procrastination happens when we aren't necessarily motivated by the thing that we say we're going to do. Also, procrastination can happen when you don't have the right conditions beforehand. So Dr. Russell Barkley talks about let's say you have a goal of, I don't know, doing your taxes. We all love that. Or um, filing papers. But perhaps you don't have a system to do that, that works for you. So you're trying to file the papers, but you don't know where to start. You don't know what works best for you. You might be in a room that's chaotic too. So then you want to start doing some other things ahead of time. Um, So you have to make sure that you know a system and you have the right plan to support you in doing what you need to do. Procrastination, um, we hear about procrastivity. What happens sometimes with procrastination is when we don't have the right conditions or we're not motivated for something, we do something else and we feel really good about it because we did it. For instance, when you do that mundane hard task, or the task that you're not motivated about, maybe you organize your closet instead of doing the task that you said you were going to do, or perhaps you start cleaning, or perhaps you do the laundry. Um, All those things, you're like, yes, I got something done, but you didn't get done what you intended to do. So that's called procrastivity. Rejection sensitive dysphoria um, is, like I said, very hot in the ADHD world. Most people who have ADHD are also very sensitive to what other people think or say about them. Um, So this is sometimes called rejection sensitive dysphoria, RSD, which is not a medical diagnosis, believe it or not, but a way of describing certain symptoms associated with ADHD. So we don't handle rejection well. Rejection from other people, when we perceive that they've criticized us, or when we feel like we're not good enough, we can reject our own self. So we might feel shunned, criticized, but it's not typically the case. And we can get very upset and emotional about that. Statistically, up to 99% of teens and adults with ADHD are more sensitive than usual to rejection. And nearly one in three say it's the hardest part 
of living with ADHD. So if you can't get your emotions in check, you feel like you're not good enough, you feel like you don't have support, you feel rejected, then your confidence is way down. And you know any little obstacle along the way is going to be challenging for you to finish that task. 100%. Um, and I'm going to run it back to procrastination. Um, we all procrastinate as a college student. Um, it's the procrastination is to a whole nother level. There's so many more responsibilities being taken on. You might not be living with your parents anymore. You have new classes, a new job, and there's so much going on and there's so much opportunity to procrastinate, whether it's, you know, taking notes and studying for an exam or uh, just paying for those certain bills. So um, I think, I think everyone out there, you know, procrastinates every now and then. Um, and I think accountability is so important. And I, I want to really stress on accountability and body doubling. We've talked about body doubling before in ADHD Power Tools. Brooke has brought it up. She's the one who taught me what, what it actually is. And it just goes in hand in hand with accountability. I think having that person or that group that um, you can go and do a certain task with is super important. For example, I have an exam in, in two weeks. I can meet up with uh, one of my classmates or friends in the library and study with them. And if it's too distracting, because sometimes us with ADHD, we, we get distracted easy. Sometimes I tell my friend, I come and let's go to the library. And we're there sitting and talking for hours on end. Maybe we can just meet there together, then split up and do our own thing. But that accountability is super important that, you know, there's someone that will hold you accountable. I think it's so important um, for procrastination ahead of time. Um, uh, I also want to bring up the 1% rule um, later. I'll go more deep into it. But um, obviously, doing, using your time wisely and doing a small piece ahead of time is always important. I know it's tough for us um, to to reach that goal, but accountability is another piece that I think um, is very helpful. Um, it, when you, when you really want to finish a task and not procrastinate, um, and it's create a schedule, routine it, create a schedule and text your friend ahead of time, reach out, um, whether it's starting a business, whether it's, um, going to work, um, whether it's carpooling, accountability is very helpful. Um, and for rejection sensitive dysphoria, we've also talked about on ADHD power tools, um, to, to help, you know, um, to help, you know, just understand your strengths is so important, reinforcing those strengths, reminding yourself of what your goals are, um, writing down your achievements on paper, putting them in stick notes and writing down your achievements, those affirmations. Um, we all are human and we have those moments where um, we forget um, our strengths, but and it's good to remind ourselves and uh, about our strengths and try not to take things too personally count to five in the, in, the, in the social setting and even by yourself, because sometimes you might get a little impulsive in the way you think. Um, us with ADHD, I do myself. Count to five, try to take a deep breath in. Understand we are all humans um, and talk to those who you trust, about, uh, talk to those who you trust about how you feel and surround yourself with loved ones and family, for sure. But um, yeah. Yeah, breathing can certainly help with focus, especially deep belly breaths can calm anxiety and stress. And when you have those anxiety and stress going on, your executive function shuts down. So it's hard to stay motivated and focus, even if you want to. Um, and you were saying about accountability, I love the body doubling, but also accountability is knowing what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, and when you're going to get it done. So if you just say, I'm going to do the dishes and you go into a body doubling session, well, when are you gonna get the dishes done by? How are you going to get the dishes done? What steps are you gonna take? Yep. How will you know it's done? What is done? Yep. And, and in the next slide, setting goals, there's certain questions that lead to, lead to you know, I'll show you right now, right here in setting goals. Let me, I'll just go ahead and ask you, Brooke, and I'll get into it instead of um, hopping right now. I'm getting excited. Um, I want to ask you, what are some tools you can give us to set goals um, and, and stay motivated to set your goals? Yeah. So you want to make sure that the goals are um, smart. Um, and I know you're going to get into that, but also um, you want to, for business purposes or for personal purposes, try to make your goals attainable in a measurable amount of time. So 
it's hard for us to vision, but we have so many goals as ADHDers. A lot of us are entrepreneurs or dreamers. So it's important. And I like to look a year out, see where I want to be, mind map, break things down, brainstorm, figure out how to work backwards from a year and then break it down by quarter and by backwards design. So then once I do that, figure out, okay, what can get in the way of me achieving this goal? Like what obstacles am I going to face along the way so I can be prepared for it and it doesn't shut me down before I do it? And also how am I going to schedule this? So just because you have the right path and actions and tools to get your goals done, if you don't have it scheduled, you're a lot less likely to get it done. 100%. Um, in scheduling, creating an action plan, organizing is super important um, in general, because you, you want to ask yourself these questions right here um, that I'm sharing with you. What do you want to achieve? That's you know knowing your why. Whose expectations are driving your goals? You, your own, someone else's. Um, and do you understand what you need to do to achieve this goal? These questions are super important because because uh, for you, you bring up understanding what you need to do to achieve this goal. You want to create an action plan, schedule, organize, write. A very important piece to scheduling, organize, writing is the one percent rule. I'm um, having the humility to set the bar low enough for yourself. Um, for example, say I have an essay due in two weeks, or say. I need to pay the bill uh, in two weeks, whatever it is. We always have something to do, so a deadline. Um, try to do 1% a piece every day. Think of a ladder and going up the ladder one step at a time, breaking down project into smaller, more manageable, manageable chunks. If, if you look at my to-do list, I have things like just getting out of bed, brushing my teeth, just walking into my car, just to cross things off to give me that motivation and um, and just set, setting the bar low enough for yourself so I can uh, approach those larger goals uh, and give myself that motivation to, to attack and, uh, my action plan. And you say ADHD thrives off structure, but hates that same time, right, Brooke? Is that what you say? So it's super important to schedule, organize, and write. You want a, di- uh, a physical calendar, whether it's on your wall or on your desk. You want a digital calendar on your phone. You can download an app called Forest. I think that's what it's called. Um, where you can plant small trees and create a forest for small uh, goals and tasks that you uh, want to do. Um, and, and you can have a little flashcard in your pocket and cross things off. There's many ways that you can create that routine and you want to schedule it ahead of time. You want to remind yourself what you want to achieve on every piece of paper you write. And um, I, think it's, I think it's super important to just create that action plan and see it in front of you and um, approach that routine as much as you can. For sure. Absolutely. And with that 1% rule, build on each small action. So um, I don't know how many of you have read Atomic Habits, but you take these small little habits and you have it stack on it. So if you know that you can brush your teeth in the morning, perhaps you can tie that into maybe taking a glass of water um, if you're not a water drinker right after it. So you, you anchor it to something that you do as a habit. And then you continue to move forward and continue to have it stack on and on and on. hundred percent, hundred percent. Well, without further ado, I think um, that that concludes our, all of our topics right there. And now it's question. Yeah, 30 <laughs> minutes. Woo. There you go. There you go. Sarai, you, can, you take it away. Um, hey. Yes. Yeah, so, um, so for our first question, um, we have, when in a hyper-focused state, um, how can you learn to better control that? So knowing your triggers that are going to get you into your hyper-focused state. So if you know that you have a lot going on one day um, and you don't have control of your hyper-focus, if you happen to know what gets you into the hyper-focused state, um, if you don't know, that's fine too. But to have something like an alarm to get you out of that hyper focus state when you need to get to the next thing. Um, I like to schedule a day where I know I can get my creative juices flowing and hyper focus. So if there's something that 
I know I can hyper-focus in, or if I do something, it's going to get me into that hyper-focus state. Try to watch out for that. It's just being aware. Okay. Um, for our next question, what can the loved ones of ADHDers do to help and not get in the way of motivation? So what I would ask is, what are you doing right now to get in the way of motivation? I mean, try to be as supportive as possible to an adhd -er. Um, I don't know if this person happens to be your spouse or a good friend and you get annoyed by them, you know, hobby jumping and having motivation to um, all these different things and not following through on it. I want, I want to say one more thing on the loved ones part. I think communication is super important. Um, ask questions uh, whenever you're curious. Hey, what can I do to help you achieve this goal? Um, is, is, is this a time that you want me to be around? Is this not a time you want me to be around? How can I help you? What, what could I do? Um, I think communication is super important. Um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I think just communicating nonstop, asking questions whenever you have something online, I think is super important. And uh, understanding their ADHD, um, understanding ADHD in general, for example, look, you're, you're here at this um, webinar. I think it's a super important piece, trying to understand and, and, and talk to experts about it. Our next question is in the chat and it's for you, Brooke. Um, they're asking, how has your ADHD been affected by your pregnancy? Um, mom brain stuff, has it been harder or has it been easier? Both. So I have allowed myself to take a step back in things that are too much, where in the past I had a lot of pressure on myself and I would um, try to get everything done right away and feel like if I didn't get something done in one day that I would, you know, I would feel bad about it. So it's allowed me to take a step back and really prioritize what's important. Sleep's important. Um, exercise is important. Eating right is important. Um, not taking my um, Adderall. So also that changes the way that I focus for sure. It also changes that little like rush in the morning that I would get. I'm also not drinking coffee, which also gave me that little boost. Um, so it's just being a lot easier myself and being realistic with when I get to that oh, point where I can't focus anymore. Okay. So for our next question, um, can you give an example of a why? Um, so essentially why is the motivation behind doing something? So if you want to switch your job, that's a big task, a big goal, getting clear on why you want to switch your job and perhaps go into this other field or start your own company. Um, if you want to, let's say buy a house and it has to be a certain type of house, getting clear on why that house is important to you. If you have a concern about a friend or a loved one, why is it a concern? So it's just getting clear about why you're feeling a certain way and really narrowing it down. Okay. So for our next question, um, how do you recommend we structure our day in order to be able to study effectively? As I find I am, I am better at studying in the morning. Any tips? Absolutely. So my ebook gives a lot of tips on how to focus. We'll share that at the end, but also knowing your time that you, like your focus time. So if you're better at studying in the morning, optimize on that time. So don't try to, Void away from it because it's in the morning. Most people, even if you get a second wind as an ADHD year, the biggest focus time is typically in the morning. How do you recommend making time for your big goals and dreams while still completing your daily have tos? That's challenging. So, as ADHD years, we want it now or not now. And when you have big dreams, a lot of times we want to get that and we want to achieve it like yesterday, but big dreams don't come 
unless you have a goal behind it and actions behind it. So going back to what I was saying before about breaking it down, making smaller measurable goals, quarterly goals, having um, benchmarks along the way of achieving things. So you can say, okay, I'm progressing towards that big dream. And like Ali said, reflecting on it. Very often we're gap focused. So you might say, oh, okay, I did X, Y, and Z, but I have so much more to do. I have like 80% left. And we, we focus on the negative because we're negative bias. But coming back and journaling and reflecting on how far we have come and what we can contribute that to. Okay. So um, our next question is, if you dig down and find that your why for something is really just boredom or restlessness, what do you do next? So why I'm, I'm not really sure um, why. So what are you trying to achieve to get to your why? So what is the task? Um, I'm not clear on what Morgan's saying with that. Mm -hmm. So maybe Morgan, if you want to write in the chat to explain what tasks you're trying to do that correlates to boredom and restlessness. Okay. She's considering switching jobs since you know my company, please don't talk. Okay. Gotcha. Um, got it. She's just bored. There's no problem with it. I actually had this conversation today with one of my clients. Um, if you're bored in your company, it means you're not challenged. So ADHDers constantly switch roles with it either in a company or in different jobs because they're bored. So ask your job when you're in it, if there's opportunities for growth, there's nothing wrong with being bored. We can get bored easily because we can acquire things pretty quickly. Um, also, a lot of ADHDers are entrepreneurs because they get bored and they need that stimulus. A lot of ADHDers um, are helpers, like teachers um, in the profession of caring for others, doctors. Um, also, a lot of us are salespeople because that's exciting and it's different every day. So if you're bored in your job, it might not be the right job for you. Uh, our next question is, how can technology help people with ADHD improve, strengthen, or develop executive functioning skills? It has to be the right type of technology. So we have, um, like, if you, for instance, on the basic level, um, if you have a planner that's online, that's considered technology, right? And you organize and schedule and part of executive function is organization. So it's knowing again, why you're doing something. And if that system in the technology field is motivating to you. So there's plenty of apps, there's plenty of things, um, that you can use to help you with your executive functions. Um, and organize and assist and focus, but sometimes we get bored of that app and we need a dopamine change and we need to micro change that app. And that's not a problem either. So um, yes, technology can definitely help, but once it stops helping, it, there's nothing wrong with switching to something else. Um, I wanna add something to that too. Uh, right now with technology, it's become so innovative, it's so advanced. Um, there's such a multitude of resources out there uh, for people with ADHD like ourselves. Um, for example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give three. I already brought up Forest, an app. I, I put it into the chat, which is a really cool um, application you could download on your phone, helping you to approach tasks and complete tasks and create a forest, which is really fun. Another thing is podcasts. Podcasts are, uh, I, I didn't even know what podcasts were until just a few couple of years back and they have really been growing into this new thing that so many people listen to. Um, we can, you can plug in your phone into your car and just listen to a podcast on your way somewhere. You can plug it, you can put a podcast on your phone and put your phones in while you're folding your clothes or doing laundry and listen to people discuss 
um, podcasts, uh, listen to people discuss um, ADHD, tools, stories, very relatable content. I think it's super important. Um, one more thing is Apple products and Google products. Um, you can connect all your Apple products under the same um, cloud. Um, if you got if if people don't like iCloud out there, um, you can do Google. If you don't like Google, um, you know you can have a hard drive or something like that. Go back to old fashioned. But your iPhone, your Apple Watch, your laptop can all be under the same iCloud where you can access all the same thing. Brooke, I know you use Google Calendar all the time. Google Calendar is very efficient with Apple products too. They send you these automatic reminders all the time, which are super, super important and help um, your executive functioning skills. You can invite someone to a Google Calendar, you can create it and really, really maximize that organization, that routine strength as much as you can. So just syncing all your products together under the same email is very helpful. Absolutely. And um, there's an app called Sansana, Sansama also, and you can bring together all of your organization systems and they compile it for you into one um, organization system. So you, if you use Apple or um, Google or Windows or um, if you use Asana, Trello, any of those stuff, you can combine it all into there too. Mm -hmm. one, one more uh, software website I want to recommend is Notion. I'll, I'll plug it into the chat as well. Notion is an awesome, awesome note-taking um, uh, program. It is super, super, it's very customizable, um, very user-friendly. The amount of options and things you could do is awesome. It's kind of like Google Docs, but it's a lot more, uh, I'd say, aesthetically pleasing. And there's so many more options. It has all sorts of really cool ways you can take notes, really cool ways you can create a calendar, a routine, notion. It, it's real great stuff. You can share things with other people. You can uh, task manage, create a business plan, take notes for your class, um, put, you know, write down your bills, things like that is very, is very uh, customizable and awesome. I'll put it into the chat. Awesome. Okay, so we have uh, enough time for three more questions. Um, we're going to start with this one. Um, can one on one adaptive sports activities help to relieve the symptoms of ADHD and autism? one-on-one -on -one adaptive sports relieve the symptoms of ADHD. Um, so what type of adaptive sports? Um, what I can say about sports in general is that if you are doing something where you are focused, right, and, and getting your adrenaline going, you're increasing your dopamine and it is helping you stay focused. So a big thing for ADHDers is um, martial arts. Another thing that can help is getting on the soccer field and getting that energy out. Um, you know, aerobic exercise is huge. So I don't know if that person answered what type of adaptive sport. I also know that there are movements that you can use to help you stay focused. And Dr. Hallowell has a whole thing on that as well. Okay, so our next question. Is it a thing to find that you hate or fear change thrust upon you, but yet also need or want change to do well? This is odd to me. If I need change, why do I panic when there is a policy change or update? Absolutely, because you don't know what to expect. So there's the fear of the change in itself um, and uh, not knowing what the outcome is going to be and trusting yourself with that change as well. And with change, you don't have all the conditions in place yet. So I get anxious about change all the time, but I thrive on change at the same time. So sometimes I have to just jump into things, take risks and not know what the outcome is going to be and be okay with that but it's the risk or reward. Okay, and for the last question, um, how can we root ourselves deeper into objectivity when subjectivity can become such a distraction when interactive with family or other emotional interactions? Hi, Dave. <laughs> um, Dave and I have spoken about this already. So how can we root ourselves deeper into objectivity when subjectivity can become such a distraction when interactive with family or emotional interactions? 
Wow. So can you explain in layman's terms for me, Dave, what you're trying to say? I'm a little confused. I think I understand because I know you, but if you can dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, while you type that, John did say the adaptive sport being tennis. So there are sports um, like tennis, yes, um, like love tennis in Florida that helps uh, students who have autism. Um, so yes, I know that that is big on that if you want to look that up. And Dave, if you can't get to um, this question and break it down for me so I can understand what you're trying to say, I'm happy to discuss it another time with you. Oh, remaining objective allows for less emotional volatility, as we know. So, Ali, do you understand that? Yes, I think um, what, what uh, hopefully I, I think what Dave is trying to say is how can we how can we stay objective and, and very um, very factual instead of approaching things with uh, emotion. Opinion, yeah, emotion and opinion. Um, okay. It, it gotcha. with family and other emotional interactions. Thank you. Um, you need to come from a place of calm. Uh, you have a lot of emotional volatility with your family and preconceived notions. Um, you know, speak with them collaboratively when you are in a state of calm. If you're not, then remove yourself from the situation so there isn't that high level of emotional volatility. Okay, great. So, um, Ali and Brooke, if you guys have any last thoughts before we wrap up. Yes. Uh, in this slide right here, I'm just adding um, ways everybody can get in touch with us um, via website, social media. Um, if you guys want to take a screenshot of this, write this down really quick. Um, but um, yeah, I think that's it. Thank you so much, everybody. This was awesome. This was my, my first webinar with different brains. And if you guys want to stay tuned with ADHD Power Tools, Brooke and I have many more episodes coming soon. Um, this was awesome. Thank you. Yes. Brooke, go ahead. Yeah, no, I appreciate all of you coming here at 7 p.m. on a Thursday. I know that some of you, it's even later for you as well. So I hope that that one thing that you were thinking about in the beginning, you were able to get out of this. And if you're not, um, you're always welcome to contact me or different brains and get more uh, questions answered. You could also reach out to Ali or me through social media, ask a question or get a question answered on ADHD power tools. So just like Instagram message us and say, Hey, I'm interested in X topic. And Ali and I are pretty good at saying, all right, we'll do a 10 minute webinar on that or a 10 minute webisode on that. hundred percent. Yeah. Leave, leave comments in, on our YouTube videos. Um, DM broke the end different brains and um, we'll see what we can do. hundred percent. But um, yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our amazing moderators and panelists. And thank you for everyone for attending. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you did enjoy this panel, please consider making a tax deductible donation at differentbrains.org slash donate. Um, so from everyone here at Different Brains, thank you and good night.